This is a Relay Project. Real Talk starts right now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. Welcome to this edition of Real Talk. Jesperson here with uh, John Hicks. Coming up on today's show, we're going to be talking to the founder and publisher of Canada's National Observer. Linda Solomon Wood's going to join us in just a little bit. The, the, the fight to save journalism in Canada. And if you're rolling your eyes and saying, oh, don't be so dramatic, you might not be paying close enough attention to what's going on. Have you, have you been digging into Bill C-18 at all, the online News Act, it's being debated in Ottawa. This is the standoff, so to speak, between the federal government and big tech. We're talking about Facebook and uh, Meta, of course, Google, Twitter. The Canadian government wants them to pay up for content that they're using, for journalism that's being produced by outlets like Canada's National Observer. Of course, big tech is just saying, well, what we'll do is just make those services or that content unavailable in countries like Canada that push back. So where does this leave you? That's the question. We're going to talk about where people are getting their news, and we're going to talk about exactly why those sources are threatened. We're also going to be talking to Canada's Minister of Environment and Climate Change today. The Honourable Stephen Gilbo will join us. He's in Alberta this week for meetings, including with Alberta's Environment Minister, the Honourable Rebecca Schultz. Uh, and they're going to be talking about Ottawa's plan to get Canada to a net zero electricity grid by 2035. New numbers, a new report suggests Suggest that this could be very damaging. We're talking nine, ten thousand jobs lost in Alberta or Canada's energy sector, in particular in the oil sands. Does the minister buy those numbers? And if so, what's his plan? We're going to get into that in the second half of today's show. You know, we're well into summer now, and of course, that means that for a lot of you, the kids have wrapped up the school year, and and now they're at home, right? And maybe things are winding down for you at work as well. You've perhaps got vacation on the brain, but you're thinking bigger than that, right? You know that summer is the best time to take that real estate course you've been thinking about. It's the best time to start a career you actually love. Why not leave cubicle life behind for good with Rello? I loved Aaron Jajak's comments on how he just couldn't fit into an office cubicle yesterday. <laughs> I loved that. Well, if that was something that resonated with you, you are going to love Rello's online real estate courses. They're fully accredited to help you get your real estate license in the province of Alberta. Plus, they've just added a commercial real estate course to their offerings, and they've got more courses coming soon. Get licensed the easy way with Rello's convenient self-paced courses. And you can visit them online. That's R-E-L-O, Rello.ca to get started. Johnny, could we tee up our TikTok from yesterday? Is that something we can roll? Is that is that possible to do? I wanted to let you know, and, and maybe we don't say this enough off the top of the show, but you can follow us on Instagram. You can follow us on TikTok. Of course, we're on Twitter as well. Our handle on all three of those platforms, Real Talk RJ. And we do our best to, to boil down some of our big interviews, some of our big conversations to 60 seconds or less to give you an idea as best we can of the key message that our guests are bringing to the table. Now, we've been welcoming liberals and conservatives to the show this week. It was Tourism Minister and Associate Finance Minister Randy Boissonneau Monday. Yesterday, it was Conservative MP Mike Lake, who served on the Environment Committee. We played you some video of him grilling our guest today. That's Minister Gilbo. Uh, Mike had a lot to say, MP Lake, about the oil and gas sector in Alberta and what he perceives to be a liberal plan that's out to lunch. He said that the world wants Canadian oil, but this government is hamstringing Canada's economy by shutting it down ahead of schedule. Here's, here's a portion of what Lake had to say yesterday. 
The reality is the world is using oil and gas right now, and we've stopped selling it to some degree. We've got a government right now that's decided to put the brakes on in a world that continues to use oil and gas. If you look at the numbers, uh, Alberta's outlook's pretty good right now for oil and gas production. Do you, do you think that the reality of that is, is lost in the mix of, of all the saber rattling and political posturing around pipelines? The fact that the oil and gas industry is actually doing pretty good in Alberta right now. Look, if you take a look broadly at the Canadian economy, we're running tens of billions of dollars in deficit. We've taken on more debt than at any time in Canadian history. We have to take steps to deal with the economic impact of that. One of the ways that you can take steps is to increase revenues. One of the ways that we can increase revenues is to, instead of importing $14 billion in oil, as we did in the last year that was recorded, 2021, we could be selling Canadian oil. That was Mike Lake, the MP for Edmonton with Taskman on the show yesterday. We're going to put those comments in front of the environment minister later on, but we wanted to know where you land on this. Remind you, you can send us an email anytime to talk at ryanjesperson.com. Johnny, I was checking out the comments on our TikTok post. Some people were saying, you know, Jeff says there are so many projects on hold right now. Marinus said if only Alberta refined bitumen to sweet crude that could be refined to fuels across Canada. You know, Canadarm said this makes sense. You know, Trudeau buys pipelines with our money, then shuts them down. I mean, that's not accurate, but goes on to say our economy would be booming right now if we had pipelines. Pierre Polyev for prime minister. Old tired mum says, or we could stop subsidies going to oil and gas that could put billions back into government coffers. And the mayor of Mill Woods, I didn't know the mayor of Mill Woods was listening yesterday, but they said, wow, Mike's reading right off Daddy Pierre's talking points. <laughs> so we had good diversity uh, in approach on our comments there on, yeah. on TikTok. How did that land with you yesterday? I, I you know what? I, I didn't. I said this to you afterwards. I didn't necessarily agree with everything Mike said, but he's very upfront. He's very honest. And he did make some good points that, you know, especially when all these regulations are coming towards Alberta, Saskatchewan, Canada, uh, and they're not being placed the same way on other countries like he like he brought up Nigeria, et cetera. So yeah. I thought he had some good points. I didn't agree with everything he said, but that's all right. I said this to you earlier. Like he was one of the nicest guys I've ever Super met. Super nice guy. He's come into the studio. He was very polite, very, very friendly. I also want to give a shout out to Ken Clack. We forgot this yesterday. He did forget Two days yesterday. in a row, big super chat from him, $5. So we're going to start shouting people out. More. Let's let everybody know what that is because, and, and I dropped the ball on that one. That was me. So Ken, I owe you one. Uh, but, but Ken yesterday and the day before, like mm -hmm. you said, a couple of things resonated with him. Yeah. And so he he tossed five bucks at us. I don't quite understand. You understand how it works better than me, but this is called Super Chat. It's something you can do on our YouTube. Yeah. And, and it kind of highlights the comment. It he, highlights his chat comment and keeps it pinned there for a little while. Yeah, right? it, it kind of puts it to the forefront. And we're testing it out right now because what we eventually want to do is put these Super Chats in front of our guests. Yeah. Uh, we're going to try to moderate them because we don't want people just spewing whatever. Sure. Uh, but eventually you'll be able to see them on the screen. But yeah, if you if you want to have your comment and, and we're, we're not pushing for people to give us money, but it was nah. great that he appreciated the yeah. uh, the guest. And he also realized that I think one of his questions was read on the Monday is what he really liked. He so, liked that, too. Well, so, this yeah, is, check this out is Super Chats. The, uh, this is the equivalent of, of back in the day. I remember when I, was, when I was bartending <laughs> and serving. But people would come in, and if they really enjoyed their meal, yeah. they would ask us from time to time. It would happen like a couple times every summer. Someone would say, throw a pitcher of beer on our tab yeah. and let us buy the kitchen a sure. beer. And when the, when the kitchen staff would wrap up for the night when they started shutting her down, uh, we'd, we'd present them with that pitcher a beer uh more comments dave says the government's so stupid they're shooting themselves in the foot seh said well eastern canada is shipping all their oil in from the saudis um not all of it but a lot you're right that's irving oil in particular the refinery in eastern canada mm -hmm. uh and battle axe D, D says the world's going green oil is dying irving's selling their oil division the company sees the outcome for oil patrick says alberta needs to mine its own oil and gas then we can ship it and control the market simple as that uh, a little too simple patrick but we appreciate the comment uh, we're gonna get to linda solomon wood in just a second i also wanted to remind you i'm not saying this enough we're so proud of partnering with the roar family our dear friend julie roar to establish that real talk julie roar scholarship and the uh, admission, like we want to make sure that that whoever it is, the post secondary student that's going to win this scholarship, that's going to be awarded this scholarship, has the cash in hand, five thousand dollars towards their post secondary expenses. We want to make sure that that admission process for them is simple. So we've set our application deadline for August first. If you know 
a post-secondary student anywhere in Canada, as long as it's an accredited institution, I don't know, Athabasca University maybe, a post-secondary student anywhere in Canada who's lost a parent to cancer, please tell them about the Real Talk Julie Rohr Scholarship. You can find details on our website, ryanjesperson.com slash scholarship. Uh, and we want to make sure that uh, that everybody hears about this and that that $5,000 goes towards somebody that could really use it. Linda Solomon Wood coming up in 60 seconds. You know, speaking of Athabasca University, you know it's Canada's open university, right? World-class accredited online programs and courses that offer you the flexibility, which is huge, to learn at your own pace on a schedule that suits your lifestyle. So if you're a a stay-at-home dad or a stay-at-home mom, that, that of course, life happens. You need to step away from your studies sometimes on on an unexpected, shortened time frame. You're not going to fall behind in class. That said, if you have some extra time on your hands, maybe you're a young person and the summer's wide open for you. You want to motor through a semester's worth of classes. You can do that too. You can get back on track or ahead of pace. Heck, you're setting the pace. It's a beautiful thing, a great opportunity. It's no wonder that tens of thousands of people trust Athabasca University for their future. Whether to just learn more about subjects you're passionate about or set yourself up for success in the job market, it all starts today at AthabascaU.ca. And a big shout out to our friends at the Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park in particular today. I want to tell you about the S'mores Blizzard Treat. This is a limited time delicacy. Wyatt Rudy, our seven-year-old and I, were talking about the word delicacy the other day. It's one of his favorite new words. He said, like the s'mores blizzard. I said, attaboy. I said, I'm stealing that for real talk, kiddo. Summer was made for s'mores with this one. You know, you can get your sweet, chocolatey, gooey, marshmallowy fix without the fuss of pitching a tent or building a campfire. It's time to celebrate summer. Return to your favorite seasonal blizzard treat. This is the s'mores blizzard treat at the Dairy Queens in Palisades, Nemeo, Newcastle, Westmount, and in Sherwood Park on Baseline Road. Well, they're sounding the alarm. Uh, Canadian media outlets uh, from the fledgling ones all the way up to the big ones are saying that it's not viable to do business the way they've been doing it. You've seen evidence of it everywhere. Layoffs across the country. Heck, in some circumstances, entire stations shutting down. We saw that in our hometown of Edmonton just a short time ago. Now, there's a lot of factors at play, obviously, but one of them is how people are getting their news where advertisers are going, and who's getting paid for the content. Linda Solomon Wood is the founder and publisher of Canada's National Observer. That's Canada's premier source for news on the politics of climate change in Canada. She recently authored a piece. You can read it at nationalobserver.com, Tragedy of the Commons, Google, Meta, and Canada's Online News Act. Linda, joining us now live on this Wednesday morning. Thanks so much for making time for us. Where do we find you? What a beautiful (laughs) backdrop. Is that real or is that a fake? background it's all real i have a real background for real talk wow i love it where are you linda i'm in northern bc in the discovery islands oh that is absolutely stunning kudos on the garden it looks absolutely yeah. beautifully manicured hey linda this this whole yeah. thing i mean i i want people to understand what c18 is all about and, and what the issues are but, but why don't we learn a little bit about you it's not every day we get to talk to not just the president of a media mm-hmm. outlet but the founder uh what led you to tell us about the, the start of canada's national observer and 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 how you wound up in that position kicking this off Sure. Um, Well, it really starts with um, 9-11, believe it or not. I came to Canada. uh, You'll hear very quickly that I have an American accent. I was born in the South. I was living in New York City when the World Trade Center disaster happened on 9-11. And I was pregnant with my uh, second child. And so to get out of the smoke and ash and you know, the stuff that followed 9-11, I came to Canada where I had been visiting for many years to a little island in northern British Columbia, which is where I am right now, too. And um, I had planned on going back to New York, but I um, really fell in love with living in Canada and stayed and raised my family here. When my kids got to be old enough, I... Uh, wanted to return to what had always been my career, which was journalism. I started out as an investigative reporter for the Nashville Tennessean um, and 
you know, at a time when journalism was really at uh, its heyday and we were able to do deep investigations lasting months and months and months uh, that were really geared to uncovering fraud and corruption that was harming ordinary people. So when I got to Canada, I looked for uh, a situation like that that I could participate in, found that in Vancouver there was a quite a media monopoly going on and not a lot of opportunity. Um, and I but I did see an opportunity for starting a new kind of publication that would be an alternative to that. So I started at the Vancouver Observer mm. 16 years ago and um, continued that as a, as a hyper-local publication all through the Winter Olympics. And um, past the Winter Olympics, the big story that I saw unfolding in British Columbia had to do with pipelines, one of the favorite topics of <laughs> Alberta, I know. And um, I know Albertans see it very differently often than people in BC do. Mm -hmm. But what I saw was a story that was just epic and important. And so Vancouver Observer started to cover that story really from the point of view of people, not so much as a business story, but a story about how this project was um, going to impact people's lives and the kinds of land it was going to go through. Anyway, that led us to the oil sands, you know, because that was the origin of the pipelines. So I started really, you know, becoming more interested in um, the whole oil industry in Canada and, you know, how, how, how things were going to really unfold given what for me was really a growing awareness about climate change. How were you? And, uh, sorry, to, uh, sorry to step on your toes there. We, uh, I don't want to make us feel old, but it, when when we start looking back to like 2001 and then Vancouver 2010, I mean, I feel like those Olympics were both yesterday and and 50 <laughs> years ago. You know what <laughs> totally, I mean? Totally. And when totally. you look at, I mean, I remember I signed up for Twitter to go like I was going to the Olympics. I was hosting a TV yeah. show at the time and, and my employer at the time, I kind of pushed back on social media. I wasn't big on it at the beginning, kind of ironic. I put it all out there now, but yeah. but my employer said you got to sign up for Twitter. And so my yeah. first my very first tweets were coming from Vancouver at the Olympics in 2010. I mean, that feels like forever <laughs> ago. You know, and we've seen like the, the the rise and maybe kind of the plateau in a way of Facebook. They still have you know, 2 billion users, they claim. Um, Twitter was kind of at that time just becoming a thing, but it was like for a lot of people, they didn't really understand it. It wasn't necessarily the main source of news, although the year later, I remember in Vancouver, of course, when when everybody started burning cop cars when the Canucks lost in the Stanley Cup yeah. final. Twitter yeah. kind of had a bit of a coming out party in Canada. But at the time, how were you like, how were you monetizing the Vancouver Observer at that time? How were you making it viable? How were you paying your contributors and yourself yeah. at that time? Um, were you pretty bullish on the future of independent media outlets like yours? At that time, I was reading a lot about, you know, even people at Google, like their key people were writing about how, you know, the ad, the on digital ads were going to eventually benefit journalism too. You know, that th there was this idea that all the uh, print advertising would just shift into digital advertising. So I was very bullish. I thought that was going to be the future. But I think it's really interesting to think back to that time too, because really this is where this whole thing begins with the Online News Act. Uh, and, you know, in those early days, everything was so open and a company like mine, like we, we really couldn't have become what we became without the openness of Facebook and Google. And, you know, like we were able to connect, you know, we would run arts. If we did a, an article back then that went viral, that meant that like 150,000, 200,000 people would read it. And that all came through Facebook, you know, and I remember, you know, just, just one article after another that we would publish that, you know, with a, a strong headline or breaking news and it would go viral on Google, you know, so, so digital media grew alongside Facebook and Google. And there's no doubt about that. And so, you know, anything I have to say about, you know, where we are right now with Google and Facebook, which is in a face down, 
you know, it's a face down between Google, Meta, and the Canadian government. And yeah. For the few of you that don't realize what Meta is, Meta is Facebook. <laughs> Meta, you know, Facebook changed its name, I think, very much in response to all the blowback that happened to Facebook around fake news yeah. and, you know, right. So now they're Meta. So, you know, it's not to say that, you know, digital media has not grown up side by side with Facebook and Google, it has. But meanwhile, for the big media companies like, you know, Post Media, Toronto Star, even CBC, you know, that that were really uh, able to run their business models on the backs of advertising, they've been gutted. Yeah. Uh, where did so if I can ask you, I mean, obviously, you can speak with great authority on Canada's National Observer and the business that it is and the perspective that you have. But but you've also got uh, a great understanding of the media landscape across the country. You've participated in, in, in hearings and forums and you write all about it. Uh, uh, we'll link to your uh, editorial in the show notes here on Facebook in the podcast so people can check it out. But where in your assessment did it start to go sideways? Like where did the relationship start to sour? Well, I, um, I think that back in, tw in, in uh, 2017, across Canada, news executives were really starting to uh, want to push back, want to draw a line with Facebook and Google, and to they, they saw their businesses really, uh, you know, the business environment getting dire. For journalism. And um, they began to look to the federal government to, to regulate the, the social media companies who, you know, in one year alone, like 2021, um, made about 10 billion from online advertising, from sorry, from Canadian advertising on their platforms. Now, they do not pay taxes in Canada. And so what I started to hear in 2017 at these roundtables that the government was holding for media executives or that uh, and, and that some of them were held by the Public Policy Forum as well. Uh, and what I was starting to hear was, you know, help that we need to level the playing field here. Like our companies are taxed on everything and you're not taxing these you know, big media, big social media companies that are based in the U.S., but actually have their business addresses in Ireland. And so they don't pay taxes in Canada and they don't pay taxes in most countries in the world unless they've been regulated, like they have been in the EU and now they have been in Australia. And, you know, so what we're seeing here is the outgrowth of really, uh, you know, eight years, I don't know, seven, eight years of uh, efforts by Canadian media companies, including CBC, to uh, get the government's help in saying, really, the government is now asking social media companies to create, to divert 300 million out of that, you know, those billions of dollars of ad revenue to support Canadian media. Yeah, and, and, the, and for... for what it's worth big tech is telling ottawa to pound sand basically uh, <laughs> yeah. you you quote you, you quote shoshana zubov uh the the publication the age of surveillance capitalism uh the fight for yeah. a human future at the new frontier of power you say that you you point out that uh zubov warns that by the time we comprehend the true extent of big tech's demolishment of democratic institutions big word to use uh public safety and the individual privacy it may be way too late to regain control so like you said, Ottawa, and this is um, referencing a report from uh, CTV, as, as Bill C-18 became law in Canada uh, last month, the liberal government and the tech giants, like you said, basically at a, at a face-off, a standoff, I mean, they're going head-to-head -head here, um, it'll require companies like Meta and Google to compensate Canadian media publications for making news content available on their platforms. It would seem to make sense. If you want to use it and profit from it, then you should pay for it. Uh, the law not yet in effect, but Meta and Google immediately responded by saying they'll just block Canadian news content from their websites. And, and this is what they've been saying that they were going to do basically the entire time. 
so the Angus Reid Institute issues this report. The numbers were out last week, I think maybe the week yeah. before. Um, about 60%, 61% of Canadians agree uh, that tech companies should compensate news organizations for their content. I don't know what the hell the other 39% are thinking. <laughs> but, but I, you know, a similar number, 63% of Canadians are concerned about losing access to Canadian news on their go-to social media platforms. So half of Canadians polled say the feds should back down. What do yeah. you think is the appropriate play here from Ottawa? All things considered, you understand yeah. media, you understand the future of news, and uh, I imagine you'd like to keep your business running. Yeah. Well, I think that Ottawa absolutely should not back down. I think they already have given a little ground, and, you know, I wish they hadn't, really, because I think that, you know, I just really want to ask Canadians to consider where is the line? When do you draw a line? How do you draw a line? How do you get them to pay? You know, it's one thing to think they should, and it's another to actually make them do it. And how do you get them to compensate in a way that seems fair and balanced and um, is of a proportion equal to how much they have profited? from Canadian content and from, you know, Canadian consumers as well. And, you know, should really taxpayers, uh, you know, be bearing the burden of, you know, paying taxes when a mega corporation like Google does not. What, what how does that make sense? Yeah. It's like, $300 million it, on one hand is it's obviously an enormous amount of money and on the other hand it's a drop in the bucket uh, when you're talking right. about this but I just I, I don't know it's it's one of these things where I mean you know pick your metaphor pick your example it's like the favorite yeah. ma and pa restaurant you know a, a three block walk from your house that all of a sudden closes and you go well, well what on earth when, I didn't think that was ever going to happen and then you look back yeah. at where you've been going out for dinner and it was never at that yeah. restaurant never supporting the restaurant or, or whatever yeah. Um, and I, I just, I mean, I'm, you know, we have obviously, uh, you know, we fight and claw for viability here and, and, and thankfully we've got uh, Patreon supporters and we've got awesome sponsors, but, but, yeah. you know, if people don't find value in, in the big stuff you see, I mean, it's, it's wild, Linda, we had a, we had an entire radio station just shut down in Edmonton, like, I don't know, three yeah. weeks, maybe a month ago, like just, just went dark, just, just all of a sudden just flick the switch and just shut it down that is inconceivable considering what people would have been paying for, for or what people would have been doing posturing acquiring companies for broadcast licenses like 10 15 years ago to just shut a station down is mind-boggling yeah. yeah and it is mind-boggling you know we just we adjust to these things but you know there have been like 300 newsrooms that have closed in nor in north america over the last decade at least and, you know, when I talk about a tragedy of the commons in my piece, what I'm really referring to is, you know, my really strong belief that uh, journalism is absolutely essential to any democracy. You know, that if you don't know what's going on, you cannot make good decisions. You cannot, um, you know, you can't protect your freedom. You can't protect your uh, environment. You can't protect the future. And so I think that we really have to, to fight for uh, Canadian journalism to remain strong. Um, otherwise, we're just going to be reading our news through the lens of, you know, publications that I love and respect, but I just don't think they're best to cover Canada. Well, sure. And so, I mean, a lot of people are also going, well, I'll just find out what's going on, like on TikTok or, or citizen journalism or people posting. And it's kind of like, are we, <laughs> like, are we no longer concerned about credibility and vetting? And yeah, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like it just. Well, yeah. And that's it. You know, Kara Swisher in Pivot was uh, talking. You know, I mean, what we're talking about when we talk about journalism is fact based reporting. Yeah. We're talking about, you know, uh, a methodology that bases bases uh, stories upon facts. And when we're reading, you know, we're <laughs> looking at TikTok videos and, you know, we're we're uh, going down rabbit holes on Google and YouTube like we just don't know. If. 
you you can't be sure no. where people are getting. And, and I'm not 100 percent confident. I'm not meaning to insult my fellow Canadians, but I see evidence all the time. I, I don't have great confidence in everybody's ability to identify reliable sources versus bullshit ones. You know what I mean? No, it's very hard. Yeah, it's very of hard course for it is. And, us. you know, and, and there are some there are some savvy bad actors out there that that have sites that look credible that absolutely are not. And so, I mean, there's a yeah. lot of balls in the yeah. air. There's a lot of factors at play. Yeah. Um, hey, I wanted yeah. to let you know, uh, Max Fawcett, uh, your lead columnist, who's been a great friend of this show as well, uh, just this morning published, uh, Stephen Gilbo needs to call the oil industry's carbon <laughs> capture bluff. I uh, wanted to let you know we're talking to the minister right after you, so I'm going to put that in front of him, so that'll be a good one for people to That's check great. out. That's uh, great. That's great. Linda, thanks for, thanks for uh, waking up early for us on the West Coast. Enjoy your day on what looks like an absolutely marvelous uh, setting, and, and keep up the great yeah. work at Canada's National Observer. We sure appreciate Thank it. Thank you so much, Ryan. Yeah, you bet. That's Linda okay. Solomon Wood. She's the founder and publisher. You can check out what they're doing there at nationalobserver.com. Canada's uh, environment minister coming up in uh, two minutes or less. Wanted to let you know uh, Friesen Brothers is hosting Watermelon Fest. Yeah, it's going to be as fun as it sounds. Coming up on Saturday, July 22nd from 2 to 4 p.m. The event's going to feature uh, various activities, but the, the, the star of the show is going to be whoever wins the watermelon eating contest. Uh, <laughs> you have a chance to win. How do you think you do it? I need to know, it. Was it seedless watermelon? I'm, I'm only laughing because I literally was watching videos of people doing this yesterday. P- people like professional watermelon eaters, they're crazy. I didn't dude. know that was a thing. They can eat like a whole slice in like a sec- less than a second. Like, it's got to be seedless, it's right? It's insane. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, uh, if this is resonating with you, uh, you're going to need to go to Friesen.com slash Watermelon Fest. Uh, you could win a watermelon prize box, uh, including a Friesen Brothers gift card. There's going to be free balloons and crowns for the kids. A ton of summer fun. You can check it out the event online. That's coming up July 22nd. Plus, it's Ivan. Sausage Summer. You can learn more about that. Uh, I recommend their breakfast sausage. I like the sweet German sausage. That's one of my favorites. Uh, You can find them at 16 locations across the province. Friesen Brothers is Alberta grown and Alberta owned. Uh, You know what else is proudly based out of Alberta? It's Apex Automation and they're hiring right now. Had so much fun out on the golf course at the ranch with Adam and Aaron Berlinick. The two members, they're two of the founders uh, at Apex Automation. I said, what's the number one thing you want me to tell Real Talkers, they said, we are hiring. They said, put out the call. They're looking for Canada's best and brightest engineers that are looking for a future working uh, pipelines across Western Canada, natural gas processing facilities, chemical manufacturing plants in Alberta, BC, and Saskatchewan, potash mining, robotics, material handling, like, like overhead cranes, all the cool stuff. They're automating it, and they are one of Canada's fastest growing firms for good reason. They put people ahead of profits, and the evidence is all over the place how they believe in the corporate culture being a positive draw to growing their team. You can learn more about working at Apex by checking out apexautomation.ca. Also wanted to mention that Kubi Renewable Energy is hiring, and this is a bit of a different place to work than anywhere else. I mean, if you're sick of the grind, maybe you're a journeyman electrician, uh, maybe you're an apprentice coming up through school, wouldn't you love to work for a company that has cold beer on tap and Friday ball hockey tournaments? What about a company that provides investment matching? How cool would that be? A company that invests in your education and your career, offering training and assistance, everything from safety and equipment courses to trade school engineering seminars, post-secondary degrees, all while having the ability to work or relocate across different cities in Alberta and BC. Start your next step of your career today by visiting kubienergy.ca. Also want to mention that support for this podcast and the following message comes from Pathways Alliance. Oil sands operations contribute significant carbon emissions in Canada, so the six largest companies are working together and with governments to take strides on the path to net zero from their operations. Part of their plan includes developing a proposed carbon capture and storage network by 2030, one of the world's largest. You can learn more at pathwaysalliance.ca. The Honorable Stephen Gilbo is Canada's Minister of Environment and Climate Change, and he's joining us live this morning from Calgary. It's been a week's worth of meetings uh, for the minister, including with Alberta's Environment Minister, Rebecca Schultz. It's nice to see you, and thanks for making time for us this morning. Welcome to the show. 
My pleasure, Ryan. Thank you for having me. I had a chance to chat with your colleague, uh, Minister Boissonneau, on Monday, mm -hmm. and he invoked uh, Pathways Alliance, which we just talked about. He talked about the importance of having industry leaders at the table uh, committed uh, to a path toward net zero. Can you comment on the importance of having industry players in conversation with government ministers like yourself? I agree with uh, with Randy, with Minister Bossano. I mean, it, it is essential um, if if we are to to rise up to the challenge and and find solutions to climate change. Governments can't do it alone. We 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 need to work with, with with industry. We need to work with academics. We need to work with civil society. We it you know it's all hands on decks. But I mean, obviously, industry they have the money to invest. They have the technical knowledge to to, to do this and. As uh, in your introduction, I mean, you talk about different companies, including companies in the renewable energy sector. What fascinates me uh, about Alberta, and and it's probably one of the best kept secret in Canada, is that Alberta is the place in the country where we're seeing by far the most growth in renewable energy. Uh, you're way ahead of everyone else when it comes to solar. You've surpassed Quebec and Ontario when it comes to wind. Um, so the you know it, that change those changes are happening uh, in, in Alberta probably more than anywhere else in the country right now. Yet the politics of all of this uh, combustible to say the least. Uh, you, you find yourself, I think, at loggerheads with the Western premiers, in particular in Alberta and Saskatchewan. Uh, Alberta Premier Danielle Smith uh, just uh, over the weekend responding uh, to your plan. Uh, to get toward a net zero electricity grid by 2035 said not only are the contemplated federal targets unconstitutional, they create investor uncertainty and are extremely harmful to the Alberta and Canadian economies. Uh, how do you respond to that from that uh, proclamation, essentially, from Alberta's premier? I, my, the team and I uh, and officials at Environment and Climate Change Canada, we've had in the last uh, almost two years few hundred meetings with people from 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 the the electricity sector uh private utilities public utilities and in, independent system operators uh utility boards uh, some were even quoted in the in the globe and Mail article from a couple of weeks ago saying that this consultation by the federal government was exemplary and and i met some of them yesterday here in in, in calgary and they we have we're having a very constructive dialogue and they want to be they, they they want to be part of the solution and they want to work with us. And no one that I've met in the private sector has told me we don't want anything to do with your regulations. They have questions. They want to make sure we get it right. Um, and, and, and frankly, for, for the premier to say that, you know, it's going to lead to the end of the world as we know it, when, when the regulation is even out yet, and we don't know the details and what kind of flexibility mechanisms that they, they will be in there. And I, I'd like to remind your, your, your viewers a, a few things. So the regulations are not about, it's not a fossil fuel free grid by 2035. It's a net zero grid. So we will still be using fossil fuels, mostly, I mean, essentially natural gas post 2035. But what we want to do is tackle the emissions from the electricity sector, have as much renewables as we can. But we also we know we need to have a reliable grid. You know, it doesn't it doesn't help anyone if come January 1st, 2035, people turn off the switch and it doesn't work. It, it's not good for me. It's not good for business. It's not good for Canadians. That's not what we want. But we want to decarbonize as fast as we can the electricity grid. Why? Because we know, I mean, it's good for the environment. It's going to create a lot of jobs like it's doing here in Alberta. But it's also how we attract companies, large companies from around the world who are looking to invest in jurisdiction that have near zero emissions from their electricity sector. That's how we got Volkswagen to come to, 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 to Ontario. First European car manufacturer ever in the history of Canada to, to come. And one of the reasons, not the only reason, but it's the fact that it's a, it's a low emitting grid in Ontario and the fact that there is a commitment by the federal government to be net zero because they want to produce net zero vehicle by 2035, 2030, 2033. That's a commitment they've made to their clients and they're being pushed by their investors, by their client to produce greener product. Well, in order to produce greener products, they need to go to places that have low emitting electricity and soon enough, net zero electricity.
There's a lot of people in Alberta talking about this uh, study that was published on Monday. I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with it from S&P Global Commodity Insights. Uh, it, it was out. Uh, it was prepared last fall, and, and the numbers essentially show that the oil sands sector, I'm referencing reporting from Chris Varco in the Calgary Herald, uh, the oil uh, sands sector would have to throttle back potential production by more than a million barrels, by about 1.3 million barrels per day, uh, to meet the federal government's emissions target for Canada's oil and gas industry. That's by 2030. So we're talking you know, six and a half years from now. Um, a lot of people are, are saying that, you know, forcing the industry to cut production is nonsensical. Saskatchewan's premier went so far as to say, here's this tweet uh, from Premier Scott Moe, if it wasn't clear before it is now, quote, the Trudeau government doesn't want to just reduce emissions in our energy sector. They want to completely shut down our energy sector. Uh, some people are saying that this could mean up to nine, even 10,000 job losses in the oil sands. What's your message to people that are going to see this interview that feel like their livelihood could evaporate here? Uh, so I haven't seen that study. I've seen articles that have been that uh, that have been done on on the study, but I haven't seen the study itself. Um, again, Ryan, uh, I, it fascinates me that that people would cut, would come to those conclusions without even knowing what the target is. I we're we, we're still working on, on on the regulation. I don't even know what the target is. We said that we would cap emissions at current level and that they would go down over time. We we haven't even decided what the, tra the trajectory would be. Uh, by 2030, 2035, 2040. So for 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 organizations like S and P and and others to to make those bold claims without having any of the details, um, I I I find it quite rich. Um, we we know, for example, that just by by reducing methane emissions in the oil and gas sector. And and right now companies are doing this at a profit. Like basically, they're they're capturing methane, which is which is natural gas, and 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 using it for for, for other purposes. We know that there's a lot that we, we we can do by by reducing methane. We will reduce Saskatchewan, and Alberta will reduce their methane emissions in the oil and gas sector by at least forty percent in the next two years, and we think we can get to seventy five percent, maybe near zero methane for the oil and gas sector. And 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 most of those investments are profitable for for the for for, for the companies to do that, um, to 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 come to the conclusion that that the cap on emission because that's what it is it's a cap on emission, and the Supreme Court was was very clear in its ruling on carbon pricing that the, the federal government on issues like climate change can intervene on, on on pollution that it's constitutionally we have the constitutional right to do this it's not a it's not a blanket right that we can we can use blindly. But we, if we if we do this judiciously, then the Supreme Court says the federal government can do that. So those who say that it's unconstitutional, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm, I suspect that we will probably be taken to court and and we'll see what the court decides. But we already have some jurisprudence that points to the fact that the federal government can do that if if we do it wisely. I talked to uh, Mike Lake, the conservative MP uh, here yesterday in studio representing the riding of Edmonton with Tasquin. But I think it's safe to suggest that a lot of his constituents probably work or have worked in the oil and gas sector. And, and I wanted to put one of his comments in front of you. I know that he's questioned you before uh, as part of the Environment Committee hearings. But uh, this is what MP Lake had to say yesterday. We'll get you to respond. Here it is. The reality is the world is using oil and gas right now. Um, and uh, and and we've we've stopped selling it to some degree we've we've uh, we've got a government right now that's decided to put the brakes on in a world where the that is that continues to use oil and gas if you look at the numbers uh, alberta's outlook's pretty good right now for oil and gas production do you, do you think that the reality of that is is lost in the mix of of all the saber rattling and political posturing around pipelines the fact that the oil and gas industry is actually doing pretty good in alberta right now look if you take a look broadly at the canadian economy we're running tens of billions of dollars in deficit. We've taken on more debt than at any time in Canadian history. Um, we have to we have to take steps to deal with the economic impact of that. And one of the ways that you can take steps is to increase revenues. One of the ways that we can increase revenues is to, instead of importing $14 billion in, in, uh, in oil, as we did in the last year that was recorded, 2021, we could be selling Canadian oil. How would you respond if you were sitting at the table with him? I would remind uh, MP Lake that um, during the Harper years, uh, Canada was importing 50% more oil than we are now. Uh, so, so that so that this argument that you know it's worse under uh, under our watch. 
for for oil import is simply not true. The, and and you and you look at the numbers, and we were importing fifty percent more oil um, when, uh, during the Harper years than than we are now. Number one. Number two, um, if you there was a, a recent report by the International Renewable Energy Association, it's called IRENA, and it looked at investment, world investment in in in, in electricity production, and in two thousand and two. 13% of investment went to renewables. And in 2002, 83% of investment went, went to renewables as opposed to fossil fuels. In, in 2002, uh, 87% were, were, were fossil fuels. And now it's only 12% of investment. So the world is, is moving away from, 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 from fossil fuels as, as, people, as more and more people buy electric vehicles, as more and more of our uh, of our industrial sector are moving towards electrification, um, we will be consuming le less oil. And there was a recent report by the uh, independent Canadian energy regulator that looked at different scenarios, which show that it, you know, in the coming decades, we we will there will be less demand for for for, for Canadian oil, as there will be less demand for for oil all over the world, because the European Union is also um, moving towards more and more electric vehicles. The United States of America is moving. They, they have draft regulations uh, to force car companies to, to put more EVs on, on the market. Uh, the United States is moving ahead with a very similar regulation as we are on, on clean electricity. And in fact, if people want to want to have a sense of what our regulation will look like, they, looking at what the Environmental Protection Agency has done in, in the U.S. is probably a good place to start. We try, we, we can't always do it, but we try to be aligned with the U.S. as much as we can. And on this, we ha we've had ongoing conversation with, with, the, with the United States, um, even countries like China. I mean, one, one out of two electric vehicles that are sold right now are sold in China. So as, as the world moves towards electrification, of course, there will be less demand for, for, for oil. Uh, that's that's what's happening and, and and it's going to accelerate as more and more countries and people want to fight climate change and i think we're we're, we're having a an, an unfortunate preview uh, of what climate looks in a changing world with the force fires this summer uh I mean, we could talk about fiona we could talk about atmospheric rivers and in 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 in, in, in bc um, we've entered the era of climate change. And those who tell me, well, I, I talk to some premiers and they say, we're, we're doing good things. And I'm not saying they're not. But what we're doing right now is leading to the type of climate change we're seeing in Canada and around the world. So what we're doing isn't enough. We need to do more. And we need to do more in Canada as we need to do more around the world. I want to integrate uh, audience members' comments as much as possible. David here in our live chat says, is over-reliance on carbon capture a real plan? He says, I don't have a lot of faith in carbon capture as the golden goose. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk to us about your conversation with Alberta's Environment Minister, Rebecca Schultz, and, and, and maybe let us know. I mean, is, is, does Ottawa invite the provinces to, to match investment on carbon capture? Do you believe that the provinces are, are as confident in that as part of the solution as you and the Liberal government is? So I, I would agree with your listener. I, I don't think that carbon capture is is the golden goose. I don't think it's the solution. Uh, I think it's a solution. Uh, and the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the so-called IPCC, refers to it as, I think, an essential technology to get to, to, to net zero. And in, in terms of our overall plan in, in, in Canada, and we're still finalizing that plan, but I would be shocked if um, if carbon capture and storage represented more than seven or eight percent of our overall plan. So we're not putting all our eggs in that basket. And, and and I know people often refer to carbon capture and storage for the oil and gas sector, but we'll need this technology for the cement sector. We will need it for the electricity sector, where we will still have natural gas online in 2035, but where the emissions from those from those natural gas plants will will have to be captured and, and sequestered. Um, so, I, number one, so it, it is part of the mix, but it's not, you know, it's one of the tool in our toolbox, but it's not the only one. Um, do I think that provinces, uh, I mean, yes, we would like provinces to, to step in and, and, and support the, the development and the deployment of that technology like, like we are federally. Um, it, it would, and I think I'm, what I'm hearing from, from industry and, and, and Pathways Alliance, for example, whom I've met a, n a number of times with my colleagues, Minister Wilkinson and Minister Champagne at Economic Development, 
is that they too would like would would like the Alberta government and the Saskatchewan government to step up to the plate um, uh, on on, def- on on supporting these type of technologies. Have you had? Have you? I, I saw that uh, people can follow you on Twitter. You met with uh, Alberta's uh, Parks Minister Todd Lowen. Um, I think it was yesterday. Is that right? You said yeah. discussing Banff Bow Valley's infrastructure and transportation. You talked about a national urban park, Elk Island National Park uh, near Edmonton. Um, you talked about collaborating to achieve Alberta's objectives and enhance beautiful areas for everyone. There you are, both with big smiles on your faces. Who said that it wouldn't be possible? Minister, um, have have you had your meeting yet with Environment Minister Schultz? No, I'm meeting her a little bit later on this afternoon, Ryan. Can you tell us what's what's on the docket? Can you tell us how you would gauge that meeting to be a successful one? Well, um, I I called her briefly after her nomination just to congratulate her. So we we've already had a very brief conversation. It's going to be our, our first real meeting. Um, I, I mean, certainly uh, talking about the the, the working group uh, that we will be putting together between the federal government and the Alberta government, both on the clean electricity regulation and the oil and gas cap, following the, the meeting between the Prime Minister and, and, and Premier Smith. Um, Premier Smith actually uh, came into the meeting with uh, with Minister Lowen just to say hi uh, yesterday. So she did a, did a little surprise visit. Um, that's So with Minister Schultz, certainly talk about, uh, about these two things. Um, the first uh, element on her mandate letter is also a very important element to me. Um, how do we uh, how do we find a sustainable solution to to oil sand tailing ponds? We we know that there's been lots of problems. I I, I know you, you had Chief Adam a few a few months ago, a few yeah, weeks ago. That's right. Talk about that for for uh, uh, Chief Adam from uh, from Fort Chippewan. Uh, and this is something we're very seized with. Um, we 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 have in fact created another working group uh, between the federal government, the Alberta government, uh, Indigenous nations that are uh, down downriver from 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 the from the oil sands, both in in Alberta and in the Northwest Territories. And and what those nations are asking, and I think you probably heard that loud and clear from 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 Chief Adam. We need a risk assessment of 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 the state of the tailing ponds right now, and that's certainly something we're favorable to. Um, we need better monitoring system and and a more transparent monitoring system. I don't I don't want I I don't think that uh, the information on you know if there's a leak that it should be left to a company to disclose it to either the Alberta regulator or the federal government. We didn't learn about it for almost a year uh, after the, the, the leak had started. Same thing for the Indigenous nations. This system doesn't work. Let, let's figure out a system where we have, uh, you know, it's 2023. We can have almost real-time information, and it can be uh, this information can can be provided in a very transparent way so that everyone has access to it at the same time. And the third thing we want to do uh, on uh, that, that we're hoping that this working group can achieve is how do we find the long-term solution to, to reclamation uh, of, of, of the tailing ponds? I think that this is something the company wants, something the Alberta government wants, certainly the Indigenous nations and us as well. Uh, if people want to check out my conversation with uh, Athabasca Chippewa and First Nation Chief Alan Adam, they can uh, go back. It's our March 6th episode, and you can find that on YouTube or, of course, wherever you get your podcast. Minister, I know you have a hard out three minutes from now. I- I'm going to try to fit two questions into that. One, um, let me read this. Jillian says, folks don't understand how much pressure companies are under uh, to produce green products. They're looking to invest in areas where it's easier for them to do so. Justin says, oil and gas companies are not just fossil fuel companies they're energy companies they have an incentive to invest in renewables ken wants to know uh why the oil and gas sector is being specifically targeted when the carbon tax is supposed to mitigate emissions equally for all businesses what would you say to ken um first i'd say that the carbon pricing is applying across the board in in, in canada and um so the the oil and gas industry isn't isn't unfairly targeted i mean we we're working to to cap emissions in in the electricity sector. We we we're, we're talking about that. But by, by so I have I have a net zero grid by 2035. I'm I I presented draft regulations for for a zero emission vehicle uh, target, which is basically you know we want 100 percent of light duty vehicles sold in Canada by 2035 to be net zero. That's a cap on emissions for 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 the for for the auto sector uh, as well. So we're 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 working across the board to ensure that our industrial sector and that Canada as a whole is moving towards lower and lower greenhouse gas emissions 
and 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 we have we have a collective target of net zero at the federal level. The Alberta government says they want to they want to achieve net zero by 2050. The oil companies say they want to achieve net zero by 2050. If you want to do that, you can't wait, uh, you know, 2045 and start working on it and hope to, to, to achieve it in, in, in five years. You have to start working on it now so that you, you, you get there by, by 2050. Minister, certainly respect your time. We appreciate your availability. In closing, real quick, I just talked to Linda Solomon Wood. She's the founder and publisher of Canada's <laughs> National Observer. Uh, obviously, this isn't exactly your portfolio, but you do sit around the cabinet table. Uh, what? When I was at... Yeah, your, your audio just cut out there for a brief second, but but I'll, but I'll have this over to you. Just your comment on, on polling from Angus Reid that shows about half of Canadians polled want the feds to back off. They want Ottawa to back off in this battle with uh, big tech. Uh, what would you tell that half of Canadians polled that say the government shouldn't be implementing, shouldn't have passed C-18 into law? I would respectfully disagree with them. And I would agree with Linda, who said that we shouldn't back down. Um, and I, I was heritage minister. I started working on that bill when w- w- before I became environment minister. This is essential that we do that. These companies get 80% of ad revenues. They benefit from your work. They benefit from Linda's work. They benefit from work from journalists all across the country and, and media outlet all, all across the country. And they don't want to pay their fair share. And I think they should be paying their fair share. And Facebook did that in Australia. I, I was working with the Australian government when they introduced their legislation, which is very similar to, to, to ours or ours is similar to theirs. And Facebook uh, pulled the, the same type of, of stunt. And after a while, they stopped. They, they started being reasonable. They sat at the table. And now the system is working in Australia. And, and you know, all held in broke loose for, 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 for Facebook. Neither will, will it here in Canada for Facebook or, or Google. I think that the, it's, a, it's a scare campaign. And, and we won't back down. Uh, the Honorable Stephen Gilbo is Canada's Minister of Environment and Climate Change. He's joining us from Calgary ahead of his meeting with Alberta's Environment Minister, Rebecca Schultz. Thanks for doing this. Thank you very much, Brian. Have a good day. You bet. You as well. And I want to thank our audience. Uh, live chat was banging uh, through this entire thing, which is great. Um, you know, Ken responds, by the way, says, I understand the minister's argument, but the rationale for the carbon tax loses its strength if some industries are treated differently. Mm-hmm. Uh, he says economist Trevor Toom also makes this point. Glenna says 2050. OMG says we need to get our act together far sooner than that. Um, Alberta Girl says the energy regulator has no accountability and can't held uh, be held legally responsible for errors. We need to fix that. We've talked a lot about the energy regulator on this show, including with uh, Markham Hislop from uh, Energy Media, Energy News. Uh, you can catch that. I think that was about a month ago we talked to Markham. I'm so bad on dates. I, I'm, you know, someone else, I'll say to someone like, how old's your kid now? Like, you, they got to be like eight months. And they're like, our kid is four. <laughs> like, but I, I think, <laughs> but I think Markham was here like about, a month ago ish approximately <laughs> um mark doran who's obviously been a fierce advocate for uh, accountability in alberta's energy sector says we got to try looking at the industry as a whole not just tailings ponds um you know i mean we've got a lot of great comments on here so we sure appreciate that and, and we appreciate your engagement this is the, the most engaged audience in canada without a doubt and and uh, we don't take that for granted uh plain power wonders when will it become imperative to, to undertake change uh, the world is on fire, and yet most leaders deny it. Tracy says reluctance to change is normal. Fear is normal. But suffering from the impacts of climate change are going to become more normal. Is this truly what Albertans, and Tracy, I might add, Canadians want? So I uh, got people uh, chiming in in good faith. You can also send us an email. And, uh, of course, if you wanted to uh, uh, maybe, I don't know, tee off on Trash Talk, that's coming up on Friday, of course. Uh, make sure you put Trash Talk in the subject line your email, and we'll put it into the appropriate file. Um, I love when conversations about Jasper National Park come up right after comments or interviews about the environment. Uh, because, uh, very simply, it allows us to remind ourselves what we're fighting for. Every Wednesday, we head out to the mountains, uh, courtesy of our friends at Tourism Jasper. It's a tradition we call My Jasper Memories. And I love talking about fishing. Any chance I get, I am happy, I am more than happy to talk about fishing, uh, let alone if and when I have an opportunity to show 
photos of fishing and in some cases the fruits of labor uh an amazing brand new business is opening up in jasper it's jasper park fishing and we want to put this on your radar if you're headed out to jasper today maybe you're listening to real talk on a podcast maybe you're live tuning on the mixler live streaming audio app on your way out there Uh, If you have any nostalgic experiences, then I don't need to tell you about the value of getting a line in the water. But maybe this is a new adventure for you. Maybe you're going to try this out for the first time. Whether or not you're a a first-timer or a veteran angler, Jasper Park Fishing is leading guided fishing trips to some of the national park's most scenic spots. It's a brand new company, and they're offering safe and fun-filled fishing adventures to families, business groups. How cool would this be for, like, a corporate retreat? Um, Anglers, both, as we said, new and experienced. You can fish for trout in Moline Lake. You could fish for Northern Pike in Talbot Lake. You could learn to fly fish in the Moline River. Have you ever done any fly fishing, Johnny? This is like... Ryan, I don't fish. You don't fish at all. You've never fished in your life. Well, We're when I was like eight. When you were a little kid. We got to get you back out there, man. <laughs> no. I, the, 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 I just watched a river runs through it. Just like oh, that's a cr- with Brad Pitt. With Brad Pitt. Oh, amazing. And, and uh, Tom Sterrett, is Incredible. it? Incredible. I just, I just watched it again. Uh, the Robert Redford film is from 1992. It popped up on my Netflix. A rebel and, Fisher. Oh, my gosh. I mean, just... <laughs> The, the religion, I mean, if you're a fly fisher, I don't have to, you know what it's all about, but it is just these spiritual moments out in the water, uh, the, let alone the Moline River. I mean, the, the, the scenery all around you would be incredible. Uh, Ryan Catherwood is the owner of this outfit of Jasper Park Fishing. He's been fishing since he was two. Uh, says that kids especially love Talbot Lake where you can get Northern Pike because it's clear enough in parts you can see, you can watch the fish biting your line. How great is that? Uh, whether it's passion, adventure, or even therapy that you're looking for, your tour options uh, could, can go for four hours. They can go for 10 hours for some locations, and the Learn to Fly Fish package is a must. All the guides are obviously park certified, trained in first aid. They'll provide all your gear. You can check them out online at jasperparkfishing.ca. Uh, Johnny, you're showing a photo of, of one of my relatively recent fishing adventures. I'm not telling anybody where this is because it's one of my favorite spots and they hit all the time. So I'm not telling you where we're pulling out where we're just these big lugs, these four pound rainbows uh, without uh, without a gram of exaggeration, without the tiniest bit of exaggeration. Never. But if you want to get your own photos, if you want to blow up your own Instagram, make sure you check out jasperparkfishing.ca. It's My Jasper Memories presented by Tourism Jasper. A bunny slipper says, yeah, Moline Lake is great to fish at. We're going to be back there the next time we go. David says, fishing is an amazing Canadian pastime. Uh, Mark, by the way, says he was in Jasper on Monday, went to Athabasca Falls for the first time. Very cool. Yeah, Mark, no kidding. Hey, the, the power there and the scenery is just incredible. Uh, you're going to get out to Jasper in the next little bit, aren't you? We, you and I were talking about Christmas plans and what you're going to do. Maybe maybe welcome your family out to the Rocky Mountains. That might be yeah, a nice plan. Might be bringing my mom. Nice game uh, plan. I don't know. We were, we were considering going to BC, but now I'm thinking like, ja- oh my gosh, Jasper and Banff. It's just like, it's just like what, when I go to Whistler, it's like. It's like being in, uh, like being in a ski village or any place like that at yeah. Christmas time is just like the best. Yeah, the only thing I compare compare it to, which I haven't done, I like that is so Christmassy. Is I've always wanted to go to New York City during Christmas too. New York City, yeah, and go yeah. to Rockefeller Center and all that. But but being in a a mountainy resorty ski town, whether it's Jasper or Banff or anywhere like that in Alberta, is just like picturesque during the holidays. Yeah, so, you yeah. know, what's super cool is especially you know they're visiting from out of town, out of mm-hmm. country. Um, you know, you you land in Edmonton, you head out to Jasper, mm-hmm. stay there. Uh, and the drive out there travel. first. I mean, the drive out's amazing, and then and then the Icefields Parkway, oh. Highway 93. If you want to continue your mountain adventure, yeah. Uh, for people that haven't traveled that highway, there's really no way to explain it. It's, I mean, you you can try to find the words. Uh, it's easier if you check mm-hmm. out photos and video, but it's spectacular. Incredible, like, it's, yeah. it's it's consistently ranked. I've seen National Geographic and other outfits have have uh, you know put out publications of like the top ten most scenic drives yeah. in the world. There's like the highway to Hana on Maui, which is Ooh, a beautiful drive. Yeah. Um, pictures of that, are but Icefields Parkway 93 is always on those lists. Amazing, yeah, yeah super cool stuff. 
Um, I love this. Justin says his now wife and, and him did a mini moon trip, like a little honeymoon, I guess, to Jasper. They said for the weekend just after they got married at the start of June. Justin, congratulations to you and your wife. Um, says we loved it. Absolutely beautiful weather. He says, and I swam in a mountain lake. He says, just an amazing experience. Love being able to go. That's perfect. My wife and I went for a little mini moon after we got married out to Jasper. Did you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was good. We we were trying to stretch out the honeymoon as much as we could. So we got married down in Costa Rica. And of yeah. course, we stayed down there for a while. And then we came home and we said, it just feels too soon to go back to work. Yeah, we got to go back to Jasper. <laughs> so we exactly. both got married in, in uh, yeah, I got married in, in Cuba. Oh, did so, you? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Destination Ver- weddings Veradero. are becoming more and more and more of a thing these days. Hey? Saw, with me and her, it was like I, I'd been DJing weddings for a while. So it was and she'd been working some of them with me with the photo booth and stuff. Yeah. And it's just I don't know. And we have family in Ontario, B.C., wherever. So it just I don't know. We ch- we just pushed all the stress aside and did it on a beach and it was incredible that yeah. sounds perfect uh, meantime i'm talking to um, i mean a Khaled who cuts my hair just a beauty um he was just at a wedding over the weekend mm-hmm. he's lebanese and mm-hmm. and i said how was the wedding and he goes bro he goes what do you how much do you know about arab weddings they're okay i said i they're said i, I said charts. i don't know anything about arab weddings he says there were a thousand people yeah. At this wedding, and I go a thousand people at the mm-hmm. wedding, and so the first thing I'm thinking of is cost, mm-hmm. right? Because I'm like, I don't even know. I mean, he's uh, they're people, they're very extravagant. There are people of faith in yeah. the wedding, so he says they weren't serving booze, and so I said, okay, that's. I mean, that just means everybody's probably drinking in the parking lot, but mm-hmm. still, that, that it means that the cost is going to be cut. But still, mm-hmm. I think forty, forty five, fifty bucks a plate is pretty standard for a wedding. So I'm going, this is fifty G's for this Dude, wedding. It's a lot. But he says, he says the tradition. He says, this is how he says, like uh, the Lebanese uh, culture, the tradition mm-hmm. is people just stuff envelopes with cash. He says, even if you don't know the person at the wedding, you're giving yeah. them 100 bucks. He goes, so a lot of people like pay for the wedding in cash and have like 50 G's left over. It was exactly. amazing. Or, or they credit it and then they pay yeah. with what the cash they get. But I have a friend who specializes. His name's Johnny as well. He has a huge company that does all the Arab wedding. And sometimes he'll be like, hey, can you fill it? And I always say no. Because there are so, th- dude, a 1, thousand, fifteen hundred 1,500 people, I can't even imagine the stress that it takes as a wedding planner to organize that. I see the stress on their faces when it's 180 people. But yeah. they are they are off the charts. They are extravagant. Maybe there's less stress are... if there's a thousand people, because <laughs> it's just like a yeah. It's just like a. It's just like you don't have to. You know, if if a wedding's like forty people or eighty mm-hmm. people, you have a hard cap on your wedding. Mm-hmm. Then you're going well. What about like you know, great aunt Mabel or or my second cousin Daryl? You know, twice yeah. removed, and they're not invited, and then everybody's kind of upset. If it's a thousand, <laughs> you're just like bring whoever. You plus know? three for everybody. Plus three for yeah, everybody. Just different, stuff different the strokes. envelope. Yeah. Different strokes, different folks. Yeah, you got it. Uh, by the way, a beach recommendation, bringing this back to Jasper, Bunny Slipper says Edith Lake has a great beach. Uh, Edith Lake is one of mm-hmm. those hidden gems, so you can go check that out too. Um, we wanted to uh, let you know about a couple of things that are going on here on the show, but I also wanted to tell you about something uh, personally that I'm very proud to be a part of. Uh, we've talked to you a lot about mental health supports, and in particular, uh, we've talked to you about CASA and the CASA Foundation, the work that they're doing for children and family mental health. Well, one of the ways that they fund those services, one of the ways that they provide counseling for literally thousands of people in Alberta that need it um, from as young as as three years old uh, all the way up into the teens uh, is through their golf tournaments. And so I wanted to invite you to join me Thursday, August, uh, rather Thursday, July 27th. Uh, So it's coming up here. Uh, Join me at Alberta Springs golf club uh, just outside it's right between red deer and sylvan lake it's a beautiful track i love that big fountain when you're pulling in that water hazard around the putting green beautiful spot uh, thursday july 27th uh, we're going to get it going right around noon i think we're going to get the party started around 11 a.m all in the name of mental health this is the inaugural so this is their first ever central alberta charity golf tournament and it's raising money to support critical mental health care for kids and their families across the province of alberta um, if you're a friend of mine on Facebook or my profile's open so you can go check it out just look for Ryan Jesperson or you can find me on Twitter as well you'll find the link to register I would love to see a whole bunch of real talkers out there Um, we'll make it fun I'm going to bring some real talk swag down there uh, including our real talk golf balls Johnny we haven't even told 
with anybody about our Real Talk socks yet. We've we got, got some swag in the back. Well, we, we love to hook up our Patreon supporters. And so so yeah. we have these exclusive socks. You can't buy them on our website. They're super cool. Um, but uh, we're going to be giving some of those away at the tournament and obviously having a lot of fun for a great cause. So it's Thursday, July 27th, and you can find the link on my Twitter. That's the inaugural Central Alberta Casa Golf classic thanks in advance for considering it get a group together why not i mean if you're living in central alberta we know a bunch of you do be great to see you there but it also a great opportunity to hit the road and check out a golf course that maybe you haven't played in a while Maybe you want to hop in for the ride. Go have some fun. You keep trying to make me a golfer. You keep trying. I do keep trying to make you a golfer because I know the joy you're going to find in it. You know, it'd be like you know, it'd be like uh, there's nothing like when you hit that 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 drive right on the screws. That (laughs) feeling. There's no other feeling like it, uh, or very few anyway. Um, Hey, speaking of getting outside, we've been telling you how excited we are to have our landscaping project officially kicked off. We hired Eden Landscaping earlier this year. Um, Number one, just because I've had enough time now, they've been amazing sponsors of this show since inception to get to know Mike and his team and and to understand how deeply they care about what they do, the passion that they bring to their projects. You don't get that with big companies that aren't family owned, right? This is a different vibe with Eden Landscaping. Now, that said, they're a custom builder with more than 20 years of on-the-ground experience in Edmonton and areas, so they know what they're doing more than virtually anybody else. I mean, they've seen it all from problem-solving Uh, To taking a vision, a plan, a dream, and turning it into reality, Eden Landscaping needs to be your number one stop to bring your outdoor space to life. Whether it's ultra-modern looks, maybe natural beauty, stunning stonework, maybe you just need excavation or more lighting or a water feature, maybe in your front yard, you can work with Eden Landscaping. Get it started today, a free consultation by checking out landscapeedmonton.ca. If your building project this summer is is going to be in response to an issue, I mean, if you've been punched in the gut a little bit, maybe it's fire damage, maybe your basement flooded, maybe you've got a mess, uh, what was supposed to be a small renovation project turned into an asbestos mitigation situation once you punched that wall open. You know what that's like, right? You're going to want to leave this in the hands of the amazing professionals at Complete Care Restoration. They employ in-house personnel to deal with a ton of materials and situations that can arise, including asbestos, and their full-service trade staff can do whatever you need to get back on your feet. If you find yourself in a, in a nightmare scenario, make the best move you can considering the circumstance and check out CompleteCareRestoration.ca. We've worked with them, we've seen them in action, and we are proud to give them two thumbs up. And we mentioned Trash Talk coming up tomorrow. That's, of course, presented by our friends at Local Environmental Services. If you're running a business or making a decision for municipalities in Alberta or Saskatchewan, keep it local with localenvironmental.ca. They do a ton. The big roll-off bins, and maybe you're doing a new roof or putting new siding on your house. Uh, maybe you're looking for portable toilets and fencing for a festival or a community event. Whatever it is, if you're anywhere near Regina, White Court, Edmonton, you're going to want to check out your full-service environmental solutions partner. That's Local Environmental Services. Coming up on tomorrow's show, we're going to get into an Alberta Views report on methane. I saw that methane popped up in our chat today, by the way. Just because I didn't mention it, don't think it's not on our radar. We're going to talk to the author of a piece in Alberta Views magazine, Hidden Harm. That's coming up on Thursday's Real Talk. And Friday, we're going to get back into talk on big tech and Twitter and threads and this fight, like physical fight with Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg. It's a Real Talk Roundtable you will not want to miss. Real Talk is hosted by 